Hey friends, Dean here. Before we get you on to your episode, I want to take a moment to invite you to our next virtual online trivia night. Wednesday, May 13th at 8 p.m. Join us either on our Facebook group or on our YouTube page for three rounds of fun trivia, music questions, movie questions, general knowledge questions. It'll be a fun time and a chance to win some prizes and have just a good relaxing night uh, of some trivia at, at home. You don't even have to go out for it. So don't forget, Wednesday, March 13th at 8 p.m., Join us on our Facebook group or YouTube for three rounds of fun virtual online trivia. We'll see you there. If you think Marvel was the first studio to start a cinematic universe, take a seat and take a trip with us back to 1948 as we celebrate the classic film Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein. Stay with us. Get ready for the 3324 Podcast, where lifelong friends Dean Legiro and Eric Cooper share their love of all things music and movies. Dean has directed short films and is a music trivia buff. And Eric, trained in audio engineering, brings his extensive knowledge of music and film to the conversation as they discuss, debate, and celebrate their favorite albums, films, and much more. Welcome, friends, to the 3324 Podcast. Dean Legiro here somewhere in the East Coast, and Eric Huber also somewhere on the East Coast, just not in the same location. A little further south on the East Coast. <laughs> in this still still on the East Coast, though, nevertheless, right? Not forsaken, humid October weather. We're having really? Weird, yeah, it's rather chilly, but it's it's chilly, but it's oh, that humid chilly. You know, it was so gorgeous. Kinda, it, it was uh, gorgeous up here. Wow. Uh, I wish. <laughs> and Absolutely loving it. Now. Beautiful weather today up here in the upper Northeast. Is so. that what we're doing recently? We're, we're talking about the weather a lot. We I do talk about there. the weather a lot because that's what happens when you get old. You really run out of stuff. We've known I each other so. for so long. Like, I, you know, and when and we started this show, I, I think Eric might be afraid that we're running out of conversation. We're running out of things <laughs> to say to each other after all these years. I've known him since what, 78? Yeah. Somewhere yeah, line, you know, so right. there's a lot of, a lot of conversations. We're only now getting to the weather. We've talked about <laughs> everything else. Finally, the weather is like the last agenda. Item. Yeah, that, you're right. That's, that's how you know you are getting old. Oh man. Or at least we're not talking about how our, our, our failing health or, or, you or know, how early we eat dinner. <laughs> Yeah. Right. If we talk about like eating dinner at four thirty, then four fifteen, and then before the then it's over. Then you know what? Put a fork in us because we're done. Until, until, the malls. That, until that day, though, we're going to keep bringing you uh, the best in music and movie podcasting at the thirty three twenty four podcast. If you're joining us for the first time, welcome aboard. We are excited that you're here. There's a, a lot for you to catch up on. A lot of great stuff in the back catalog. Uh, but but you're here now, so you'll be with us going forward. And if you're returning, thank you for your support. Uh, thank you for listening and checking in every week. So we absolutely uh, enjoy this and and look forward to each one of our our episodes. In and this indeed. is uh, good. Indeed. indeed, indeed, indeed. <laughs> and this is our continuing our Spooktober Halloween celebration. This is the second film in our month of Halloween horrors, and we are talking about really one really special place for a lot of reasons, but, but mm. Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. Let's do the stats. And then we're going to jump into this really fun film. And if you haven't seen it yet, we're, we're going to really advocate why you, you really should, especially this month. So mm -hmm. like I said, released in 1948, directed by Charles Barton. Uh, the budget for this film was $792,000, which is, mm -hmm. you know, back then probably a lot of money. Yeah. It made 3.2 million back. So this was a, a, a success. Definitely, definitely there. The cast. <laughs> the heavy so hitters. Got, what's that? We got some of the heavy hitters. Oh, we got, you for, know. well, first you got, you've got Bud Lord. Abbott and Lou Costello, right? So they're yeah. the, they're the, the marquee names. Mm -hmm. And then you've got Bella Lugosi as Dracula. You've got Lon Chaney Jr. as Wolfman. Mm -hmm. You've got Glenn Strange as the monster. And then we'll go one more deeper with uh, Lenore Aubert. And mm -hmm. she's uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Mornay. Very much a Hedy Lamarr-esque actress yeah. after watching this after all these years. When I was young, I re really didn't know much about Hedy Lamarr. Mm -hmm. But now watching it, she's very much in the Hedy Lamarr mold. Well, I, I just love her the way they you know, introduce her in the credits. It's like Lon Chaney has, has the Wolfman and... And Lenore, Lenore O'Bear, uh, uh, right? She's this femme fatale. And she slinks kind of... <laughs> cartoonily across the, 
the cre- yeah the credits i mean from from beginning to end this is just a great yeah a great film like i said in the open you talk about cinematic universes well god we're we're going back to the 19 19- actually we're going back even to the 30s with the mm-hmm. cinematic universe because universal really um started with the the classic monsters this is og this is yeah the first. this is the original yeah. stuff if, you, if you're looking yeah. for like team ups and and where did this come from sure uh it, it, i think it really started here because universal started cranking out the monster films and then they said well let's start adding them to each other right let's start crossing over and putting them in the same universe as opposed to here's bram stoker's dracula here's yeah. mary shelley's frankenstein and written by different authors yeah now let's let's start throwing them in the mix and just kind of ch- you know chucking them all into movies together yeah, several, several sequels. I mean, it's just uh, Frankenstein meets the Wolfman. The how, yeah, how's and they the died at the end of each one, and then they came back. Like there was no continuity with these films. It was just like they, they, no, they not ma- at all. They it, made a cinematic universe, but didn't realize what that meant. Right. So they were reboot just going to make reboot. like yeah. Ghost of Frankenstein, and they all die in a flood, or the castle falls on them, and then the next movie <laughs> they're back, getting unfrozen or or whatever, you know, revived. And, and so that's the great thing about it too is it, it was. Not a lot of forethought in it. It was just kind of like, let's make these films with the Universal Monsters. Yeah. I mean, some of them were okay. So, they, you know, they're pretty soup to nuts. I mean, some of them are really, really well done. Some of them are not so great, you know, but they're <laughs> fun. I mean, they're just fun. I mean, I've been watching, I've actually been watching a lot of the films uh, actually on Peacock. There's, there's quite a few of them and they do have a lot of the sequels out there so you got i actually got to see bride of frankenstein and i got to see the original frankenstein meets the wolfman and and it's the sequel to you know the invisible man and and its sequels and that kind of stuff and i i it's they're just god they're staples you know they're just they're happy comfort food for me yeah because i you know when i was a kid this was pretty much all we had in terms of like like you say cinematic universe or something that we could return to something that they they could show actually show on tv around halloween time you know week to week and not just one set of movies and then that's it yeah here you have like you could you could return to this stuff like next week we'll have this one and this one and this one and in the case obviously in abbott and costello same thing every sunday when i was a kid sunday afternoons at like noon or one o'clock yeah 11 30 yeah it was like 11 11 30 to one o'clock on right. channel 11 was was the source which we're on the same page with if you lived in the new york area mm-hmm. um back in the i don't know 70s, 70s easily yeah um at 11 30 every sunday they would show it uh Channel 11, WPIX in New York would show Abbott and Costello film. That's all they did. They just rolled through the whole (laughs) Abbott and Costello canon of films every week. And then they, and then they re when they got to the end, they went to the back to the beginning. That's right. So my, my sustenance, my comedy sustenance when I was a kid literally was Abbott and Costello because it was on Mm -hmm. every week. My family used to eat dinner at one o'clock when I was a kid on Sundays. My dad would make dinner. He would make pot roast or whatever he would make. Yeah, the big So we'd go to church meal. go to church in the morning, come back, eleven thirty, Abbott and Costello was on. So you're sitting <laughs> while while my father's cooking and, and getting all that stuff ready on a Sunday. And then that, that would end at one and we would be sitting down and eating eating Sunday dinner. So it was yeah. like a it, it it was a Sunday ritual, literally. Yeah. In, Absolutely. in my house. Yeah. And I'm sure many houses in, in the area because that's what it was. Was, yeah. was every Sunday and, and Abbott and Costello at the time in the forties, they were the, the highest, the highest grossing, highest paid entertainers during like the world war two era. Mm-hmm. You know, they literally made four films in one year in 1942. I mean, they were outpacing Elvis. I mean, only Elvis had that kind of output of, <laughs> of cranking yeah. out films in a year. They, they were just, they became really popular and people wanted more. And when, when that, so you've got these two, uh, franchises or two properties that Universal owns, right? Yeah, very, and they're both very different, right? And they're, but they're both great for different reasons. That's right, and and you know they uh, Abbott and Costello, they were kind of like the the only like I think Laurel and Hardy were the the, the precursors to them, right? I mean, then or, then you also yeah, as had far like as comedy three, teams, yeah. you also had like the Three Stooges and things like that, but they were much earlier. You know, they, they're talking like 30s and, and you know, some of the even silent, I, I believe they were doing some kind of, you know, some of stuff there, too. So Abbott and Costello was definitely of their time. But, yeah, then all of a sudden they start branching out and and doing starting to, you know, to start to creep into this into into another franchise here into the into, into the uh, Universal Monster thing. 
And the funny thing is, is that it, you know, when you watch this film, it, it's not a send up. It's not a parody. It is an absolute universal horror monster movie that just happens to have Abbott and Costello in it. Well, you know, I, think they, it's, I, I think it's got two, it's got a foot in both worlds. My, my thought yeah. was, is that the comedy was comedy and the drama was drama. Yeah. Right. Like they didn't, they didn't make the monsters do comedy stuff and no. they didn't make, make Abbott and Costello do dramatic horror stuff. So it was almost like two films in one, which is a, which is a balancing act. You need to, you know, so they're respecting the comedic a- aspects of Abbott and Costello, not trying to make them do something else, but then they're respecting the horror aspects of the monsters. Right. You're not going to, for the most part, not really trying to make them do something else. You're not going to have Bella Lugosi, like, even though it was somewhat more lighthearted and he did put on a more of a performance as, you know, the, the only difference here is that he was posing as this mad scientist and trying to control the monster. And other than that, I mean, he was still very much Dracula. I mean, he's still. He's still putting people under the spell. You know, they're yeah. not going to break that mold. They're not going to act any differently here. You know, Lon Chaney is still very much oh, the, tortured. The moon, you know, the, the tortured soul. <laughs> the moon is full. Oh my, lock me, bit, lock me away. Me, lock perhaps, me away. Perhaps maybe a little more melodramatic in this for you yeah. know for for the for the moment, but um, to balance that, to sort of counter counterbalance that that com- comedic. Yeah, you have to because Ab- Abbott yeah. and Costello were were masters of the genre. I mean, yeah. you're talking you want you want to see comedy genius, and on, I don't think it's on YouTube the the real the best version, which is you know their Who's on First routine, which everybody knows. Oh my God! But the best yeah. version of it is is in the film Naughty Nineties. Yeah, and if you go on YouTube, you, you you don't ever see that version on YouTube for some reason. You see because they did it hundreds of times on their TV shows, and <laughs> and they reprised it in a, in a couple of films in shortened versions. But their their naughty '90s version of Who's on First is like the default. They caught it on film with multiple angles and just getting them to perform it. So these guys were just masters of that craft of the you know slapsticky, but but also the the just the way those two personalities worked off of each other. The Luke cl- Costello, basically yeah. the first man child. I mean, if you, you watching his films, you see where Adam Sandler and Will Ferrell yeah. get a lot of their cues from, mm-hmm. from Luke Costello who played that childish kind of adult and Bud Abbott was always like the protector or just the guy that had no, no tolerance or never believed him, yeah, which, right. which comes in the straight in, man. And you know, it just he, always <laughs> was just like, you know, come on, you know, or, Straight. He was, all, he was the straight man, but he was also the con man, right? He was always yeah. trying to. Oh, he was always he, trying to try to put fool, one over on his friend, right? right. He's fool because yeah, he thinks he's such an idiot, and yeah. you know, like, <laughs> haven't I but given the, you every? You know, don't we share and share alike? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it, a lot of times it backfires, right? So you know, yeah. it just, it's, and, it's, and they get and they get some of those routines in 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 this as well. Yeah. Um, just just to talk a little bit about the backstory is as far back as 1942. Abbott and Costello had considered doing something with the Universal Monsters, but they wanted to do a Broadway, something on Broadway. They wanted mm. to do actually like a live show, but it was just not feasible to do that with the makeups and everything. So the the germs of the idea for something like this, this kind of team up go way back. You know, you're talking six years before this film was made. So the, the, the kind yeah. of seeds were there. They just had a kind of a different idea of how to execute it and probably would not have gone over well, you know, as a live show might have been a little bit bit goofier. I think having so the a, film and having the makeups and, and all that kind of stuff. Probably going to be a lot more loosey goosey kind of thing, like variety. Oh yeah, definitely hour. some more improv. Yeah. 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 Maybe more improv heavy. Originally, the, the script was called The Brain of Frankenstein, Br- mm-hmm. The Brain of Frankenstein. So that does not lend itself well to understanding that Abbott and Costello are in it. Yeah. So that necessitated a change. Lou Costello was not a fan of this script originally. He was he not. Didn't, wasn't buying into it. But then no. once the, you know, the the key was is is they were able to get um, Charles Barton to direct it. And Charles Barton is pretty important in the El, uh, Abbott and Costello filmography because he directed the last previous five films of theirs. Mm-hmm. So they were comfortable with him. So they're like, okay, if he's going to do it. And then Lou Costello kind of warmed up to the idea a, a little bit more, but really wasn't a fan of the, of the script at first. But yeah, this is not a big storytelling. Like you're not watching this for some type of big revelation or or story or structure. It's just kind of like here's the framework, you know, and the framework yeah. is very is a very thin framework is, you know, the Wolfman is on the trail. This I, I love the the you know, I didn't think about this when I was young, but now I'm like it's so cool. It's like the Wolfman is on the trail of like Frankenstein and Dracula. 
Like mm-hmm. he's been tracking them and is trying to get to them and, and stop, the, you know, stop he's almost, yeah, from, he's almost the Van Helsing of, of yeah, of, he's trying of to stop the them story. from, yeah. from reviving yep. the monster. And he's yeah. like, tr- he's in London. So it's got <laughs> those like horror elements to it in the beginning where, yeah. you know, there's that whole separate thing. And then you have Abbott and Costello in their world do, doing, doing the whole baggage handling thing and the slapstick <laughs> and, and all that kind of stuff. So there's the, it is almost like these two yeah. separate films kind of, kind of the machinations are, are, are kind of working of, okay, here's the Abbott and Costello world. Here's the universal monster. It literally, it, it literally is two, two genres like smashing into one another. You've, you call it the mashup. This could be the, the right term. This could have coined the phrase, right? This, you know, yeah. the, it's the two worlds colliding. It's the original Scooby-Doo. It's the original, like you yeah. say, Marvel, Marvel films. It's, 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 uh, you know, and I think of like, when Lucas decided to do Star Wars and, and you talk about the droids and how they were supposed to be the comedic element to the, to the store, to this otherwise rich world building thing that he was doing. And now you see the seeds where, you know, that kind of thing was planted yeah. with, you know, but because this film was still very much a, a horror film, technically, you know, you still had the same sets. You still had. Yeah. The, the sets mood. were great. Yeah. Yeah. The mood of it was still very much in the vein of, of like you're watching just another horror sequel. Yeah. It had and the score. Just, yeah. it, it had like the, the, yeah. the, 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 the kind of the a little ho- more horror score than a, yeah. than a campy or a comedic score. So it had, it had those elements, all, all the same special effects. The, you know, the, the Lon Chaney's transformation is still there. It's like, you know, you see it from different angles, you see it from a different point of view. And he's, <laughs> you know, it's just, I, I, it's to me, it's like happy comfort food. I used to, I used to, I used to eat this stuff up. If it wasn't this, it was all the Godzilla movies, right? It was the Kaju, like when they teamed up and they fought each other. And it's like, this stuff was the best, you know, like, cause that's all we had. That's really all we had, like to to watch on 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 television. This this kind of thing. Yeah, and and it would start it would start the cottage industry after this one. They would do. You know, meet the mummy, meet Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, meet the invisible man, meet uh, the killer Boris Karloff. So that this really kind of what hit, they kind of hit pay dirt. And they were at this point in 48, kind of on the tail end of their careers already. So this kind of yeah. gave, almost gave a second life, not only to the Monsters franchise, because that kind of uplifted them and, and kind of brought it to a whole new yeah. audience. Uh, but also gave uh, Abbott and Costello a little more life in their careers as well. So it was just one of those ones. One of the things about that I that I learned about you know, also during about the making of this film is Abbott and Costello like to keep a really light, you know, set attitude and and kind of atmosphere. They like to keep it joking and, and keep everybody loose. They actually hired a comedian for his only job was to be on the set. And to like walk in and make bloopers and like walk onto the set when he wasn't supposed to and just crack people up just to keep the the atmosphere very light. Is that right? And he actually, wow. Yeah, he, that's great. he's actually in the movie <laughs> um, at, at the co- when they're at the costume ball. Uh, Lon Chaney Jr. is like, oh, do you know Chick Young and Wilbur Gray? And the guy's like, know them? I, I don't even know who they are. Like, yeah, that's, okay, that's the okay. guy. That's they the hired guy. him. Okay. They hired him not to be in the movie. They hired him to just keep people laughing off in between scenes and, and, and stuff like that. That's fantastic. And, that's great. Yeah. yeah. And there's, that's... there's one blooper where, uh, when, when bar, when, uh, Bella Lugosi is walking down the stairs, when they go to the, when they go to the castle, when he's in his, in his robes, that guy in, in one of the outtakes was walking behind Bella Lugosi and he didn't know. And Bella Lugosi was all for like the fun and games off, you know, while it wasn't rolling, but when the cameras were rolling, he was deadly serious and he wasn't too happy like about that. Sure. That the guy, yeah. you know, because it was like we're making a film and this is serious stuff, you know. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and you see this guy like so, like walking down behind him in like a, a little cape and stuff and, yeah. and just breaking it up. So you know, you gotta appreciate that that they you know wanted to keep it loose and keep things fun and sure and and, yeah. and being control of the atmosphere on the set as well, which is kind of neat because you see all this, yeah, you know, like you said, uh Lon Chaney's just so like, you know. So, uh, so he's just a little, please. And And he changes like five times. I mean, he's like five full moons in a row in this movie, which is great. He picked a bad week to find, to actually, (laughs) to to find (laughs) what he was looking for. And he, you know, the trail ends just in the right cycle. One of my, one of my favorite scenes is when, 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 when Lon Chaney comes stateside and and meets with, with Abbott and Costello and he's in the room across from me. He's like, you know, lock me away. So I don't hurt anybody. And then they, they come back the next morning and, and, and Costello forgot he had the key. So they go in and, and the place is like a wreck. And uh, Bud Ab is like, wow, this guy must have been on some bender. 
right? <laughs> like he was partying all weekend to places like destroyed and like Lon Chaney's like in a, in a pile, like laying on the couch, like, yeah, like passed right. out, you know, like turned yeah. into the wolf man. And so there's just a lot of like some great throwaway lines that just kind of add levity to it. Oh my and goodness. And you know, like you said, kind of balance out the and the, the physical the comedy. Dramatics. The physical comedy too, especially poor Lou Costello. He was a, a master at, at getting slapped, getting oh, yeah. grabbed getting beat, like just thrown, thrown into a push. wall <laughs> even Lon Chaney like like after all the stuff he puts up with from from uh from Bud Abbott he, you know, he grabs Chaney, him too and John Lon Chaney like grabs him a couple of times listen to me like I'll kill you <laughs> he's like pushing him into the wall he's like you know like, yeah when they're at the masquerade ball he grabs like Lucas he like pushed him and Bud Abbott goes into the lock falls into the locker behind him he's like I'll murder you <laughs> So yeah, there's just a lot of great like there's so much to to digest. Oh, yeah. We haven't even talked about like the monsters. You know, this isn't like Abbott Costello meet Frankenstein. Sure. Frankenstein isn't really uh he's not even a major player in this film. Yeah, he's, he's kind of on the sidelines. He's low, I guess well well for lack of a better term, his battery is low. Yeah, yeah. So he's kind of <laughs> like he's kind of in a in a, in kind of like a uh catatonic state as it were, trying to you know, and Dracula's trying to get, it has the, like the little ring. It's got, it's kind of like a little recharge ring. It kind of gives him a little jolt to get him up. So but happens the, the, to like fit neatly into the bolts on his neck. Like, yeah, it's like a little, <laughs> you know, little, little <laughs> electrodes. But the, but the funny thing, the, the whole you know, like kind of plot line is that the Frankenstein monster is really like when he's, when he's fully charged or whatever, he's just, he's unmanageable. So yeah. we need to get his brain out. We need the brain of someone who's docile, who will, who's, who's dumb, who, who can be controlled and that brain belongs to Lou Costello. So the of whole, course. the whole story really pins on the, They want to get Lou Costello's brain into Frankenstein, which is brilliant. You know, it's like yeah, the, he's, the, he's the biggest, the simpleton. most horrifying monster. And they want his brain in there. And the fact that his, um, that Lenore or bear is actually, you know, dating quote unquote dating him, yeah. which to, much to the, you know, amazement of, of, of <laughs> Bud Abbott. He's like, how, 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 how is this possible? You, you know, what are the, what is what does she see in you? And, you yeah, know, he like, he, he brings Costello <laughs> to the windows. Let me look at you in the light. So he's like, yeah, my, yeah, that's one of my favorite lines. So he goes, look at yourself in the mirror. And he's like, I don't want to hurt my own feelings. Or something <laughs> <to that. laughs> Oh, it's yeah, the, the timing, you know, the absolute timing. That's the key. Just, yeah, it is. is, is those guys are pros. Yeah. So, oh, so man. coming into this film, they had their routines. They they had their timing. They knew, they knew all the pauses and, and where to stop. And and it's yeah. just and and they recycled a couple of. They actually recycled a couple of routines from some of their other films. The whole candle sliding on the on the coffin. Mm -hmm. That was that was in hold hold that ghost where where the ghost was, right. was pushing that's the candle right. around. And yep. then when when. <laughs> <laughs> when Lon Chaney turns into the wolf man during the costume party and he's chasing like Lou Costello and he's like tripping over the, the, the logs and stuff. And Lou thinks it's Bud Abbott wearing a mask. Right. Yes. And he's pu he punches it. He punches the wolf man in the face. Like, you know, they, they told you to take that mask off. They did that skit in naughty nineties when, <laughs> when, when uh, Bud Abbott was in the gorilla costume and he was going to scare everybody off the ship. But then the real gorilla got out and then Lou Costello thought it was Bud and he's tugging on the gorilla's face and, you know, get this mask off. So here's some reoccurring <laughs> gags. The gags work, right? Yeah. They, they, they bring him back and they, they absolutely work. The formula works. So, yeah. yeah, it was just one of those great, great things where they kind of put, brought some of the stuff that was familiar to kind of kind of ground you as, as, a, as a, a viewer in their comedy world. And then you've got all this other other stuff and that happens a lot in the Abbott Costello movies too is 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 Lou will see something and and Bud and Abbott won't believe he'll never believe him no, oh you you're seeing things or that kind of stuff you know it's like no because it's not him like putting one over on him right it's like yeah. what are you talking about it's like he has no way you know he he's out of the loop so to speak so it's like you know if he's not in on the gag or whatever it is yeah you're an idiot you don't know what you're talking about ah. right it's like, you know, <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I found a few like I noticed a, a couple of like moments where uh, where Abbott is like he, he's actually uh, flubs his lines a little bit like he's like the delivery doesn't quite come out as as you know it's like so he's actually like he's fumbling over some words like yeah. you know, like he's trying to say something but he s ends up saying something else and yeah, I noticed that a couple of times it's probably the best take is like using yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> keep keep moving. So yeah, so we go so back to back to Frankenstein. See, we we go easily off on tangents on this film, very easily. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, Glenn Strange. 
So Boris Karloff was done with with Frankenstein by this point. He was actually the role. pretty yeah. pretty uh, not at advanced age, but he was, he was up there in years. So it definitely wasn't. Uh, Glenn Strange took over the role, and this was his third appearance as as the monster uh, character actor. One one of those guys you've seen around. He actually uh, was in another Abbott and Costello film after this called uh, Coming Around the Mountain. Mm-hmm. That was the one with the hillbillies and the love potion. Yeah. He's like Wilbur <laughs> when he was. Wilbur, that was yeah. it. it. Was Devil Devil Dan was Devil Dan Winfield? Yeah, and that was when they were. Tra- and then they, the the elevator goes down at the end through the through the ground. They end up at Fort Knox because they were looking for gold, and it turns out they were they were on top of Fort Knox. But uh, well, so had, Glenn Strange has had a very big co- career, but mainly as a character actor. Well, he's known for he's done a lot of westerns. Yeah, he's, he's a big guy, bad he's guy, like, you know, and, yeah, you know, Butch Cavendish yeah. and and that kind of stuff. Right. So he's he had a career there, but he took over, you know, he took over the the quote unquote monster reigns yep. uh, from yep. Lon Chaney because it was it was Karloff, I think it was Lugosi, then Lon Chaney, and then and then Glenn Strange took over. Yeah, um, Boris Karloff, he agreed. You know, he didn't want to play the monster again, but he want he did promote the film, right? Yeah, they hired which was him neat. to. Actually, that was kind of neat. You know, so yeah, he was still very much in the involved somehow, but the spirit of it, you know. Yeah, but yeah, and, and for Lugosi, I mean, we think of Lugosi as as the, so iconic as Dracula. Yeah, he only that, played Dracula once. Out, he played the second time he played Dracula was in Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. Yeah. He never there was not like he played vampires or other kind of of roles. Yeah, but the actual Dracula character was only played twice in 1931, <laughs> and then 17 years later as mm-hmm. Doctor Lejos. <laughs> that was his yeah. alter ego, is Doctor Lejos. All it's these, like all these. Yeah, it's these, it's, it's like, just it was exotic so, names. The thing, it's the, the the film is is taking that economy right. It's it's like you're you're combining characters. We don't we can't have Doctor Frankenstein in it. We can't have all these other reoccurring characters. So let's let's com- let's put Dracula in this sort of mad scientist role where he's actually in control of the monster. Now, very much, you know, the, the, the you know, his definitely a meth method behind his madness. He's still looking to do what he does and, but, you know, but have the monster as do his bidding and, yeah. and, and that kind of thing. So there, that, that brings in the horror element. And yeah, like you say, having Lon Chaney as, as sort of like, uh, again, like the Van Helsing character and just, but it's it, it kind of makes sense though, right? I well, mean, he's it's a wolf, like, you know, so I guess he's good at tracking. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but right? it, so, it, so it's, it's kind of neat, and he's he's plausible. actually on the side of good though too. And that's the interesting thing is, yeah, not all the monsters are bad. Is is Lon right. Chaney is is on the the Abbott and Costello side of things, and for the most part, the way his character is, which I noticed is. He never, he always tries to, he under, he, he's like, his character's at the point where he understands what the nature of the Wolfman is. So he's like, basically like, lock me in a room mm-hmm. and I'll be okay. Get me out of but, harm's so way. He, yep. he never hurts. He never hurts anybody that's good. He only bites one person. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he bites right. McDougal. <laughs> right. The guy that owned the house of horrors, who was like the meanest guy in the whole film yelling, um, you know, and again, if you break my, if you break my, my. Yeah, it, 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 McDougal, I think McDougal grabs Costello too. Doesn't he like throw yeah, him he into push, the he wall? Pushes like- him and, and pushes him down. And he goes, I dare you to do that again. And they, come here, bud. You know, that's assault and battery. What's your word against mine? Yeah. He's beating the hell of it. He doesn't do anything to Abbott, but Abbott gives, you he know, he's just- <laughs> I'd like to see you do that again. He's going, you know, he always does like, God, try that again. Cause he's try not the one getting, getting, getting pushed around. <laughs> Oh my goodness! So yeah, that's just some just great stuff like that. So I really liked that whole, like the Wolfman is kind of like on the kind of on the side of good because he understands that that Dracula yeah. and 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 the monster must be stopped, and he's kind of like, oh, I've got, uh, I've got information that they're at this castle, and and he's like like working. The, I don't know where these leads are coming from and who he knows, but he's right. like he's got like this information, like oh, they're at a you know they're at a, a castle, and it's and. Oh, you're you you're in Dracula's castle. You have to find the monster. You know, so it's kind of like he's yeah, he's kind of also leading the investigation. But the funny thing is, is that they're in the U.S. So this castle, like <laughs> appears where that, at, Florida, appears out of nowhere, right? It's well, in, they're on in an I, they're in Florida. Is, is where the island. is where the thing was thing. So yeah, it could be in the. Looks- it looks like a Transylvanian castle. Did you ever see anything like that in Tampa? <laughs> not, not at all. 
<laughs> no, not that, not that I recall. No, Got, you know. Gothic castle in the middle of Florida in, no. in Fort Lauderdale, <laughs> equipped with dungeons and all the like Iron Maidens and everything. Right, the torches, yeah, the, and, the, you know. the brick, the the, 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 the <laughs> rotating walls, and right. they had everything, and the fully equipped laboratory too. Yeah. Fun fact it, about 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 Glenn Strange and the monster too is um, at the end. So at the end, there's you know they they you have to have the obligatory mad scientist laboratory scene. So they're trying to revive the monster and, and mm-hmm. he gets loose and he grabs Dr. Mornay, uh, Lenore Albert, chucks her out the window, which was done in another film too. Frankenstein threw somebody out the window the same way in another film. But what had happened is just before that, Glenn Strange fractured his ankle. Yes. He got hurt. Lon Chaney was on the set that day, but not working. And he said, I'll step in. He goes, I'll step into the makeup because he's, he's been, he's done it before. So he is literally in, in the film as Frankenstein for like three or four seconds after, after she gets thrown out the window and he turns around and he like pushes the, the, I, cots, can, I, the, the I tables think, and everything like, like kind of rampaging that that's actually Lon Chaney Jr. As Frankenstein, which is kind of neat. He, I think you can tell, you know, I think there looks is, a little it, different. It's yeah. quick. It's a quick yeah, shot. You really got to be eagle eyed. Yep. Um, but it's kind of a neat thing that he would do because who wants to step into a makeup chair back then too, for hours, you know, mm-hmm. um, he's like, yeah, I'll do it. He got hurt. I'll, 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 you need me for that scene, which is kind of, so that's kind of neat too. I kind of like that inside, um, cause he had, he had done it. So he was used to it. A lot of, course, a lot of great stuff. And then of course you have the, the obligatory, also the, the, the normal straight couple, right? The, you know, you have the, the good looking guy who's the, the assistant scientist, yeah, the scientist, of course, right? so you know, the, nameless and, and faceless. And then you have Jane Randolph, who is, who is uh, another horror alum. She was in Val Luton's cat people, the original uh, film. And I think she, in the sequel as well, uh, she played one of the main characters in that movie. So she's no stranger to the horror genre. So that she plays an insurance investigator. So she's sort of, again, I think you got all these people sort of on the trail and, the, you know, they're trying to figure out what's going on and that kind of thing. So she's trying to, you know, infiltrate her way into it. And of course falls in love with the handsome guy, you know, who's, and, and they have their own little separate story going on there, you know, and it's, it's, in, but Lou thinks that he's, you know, a playboy. Like he thinks, cause she starts coming on to him as well. Yep. Right. Because and, 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 and of course, Abbott's like he's trying to finagle like, oh, well, you know, you got two. And well, what if there was a third? <laughs> what if, you know, and he's like, well, you can have the third, you know, like that, that joke where he's like, yep. the, he makes yeah, up the, another name. What, what if a third one comes? What's her name? Mary. <laughs> Mary. Well, what if, what if, you know, what if Mary? Well, well you could have Mary. Well, you could have Mary. <laughs> Yeah, he's uh, like, you know, you, you take Sandra and I'll take Joan. Or, no, no, you take, you know, and, and they do those classic things too, where it's like, you know, you, you check the basement and I'm going outside. He's like, no, you're not going anywhere, Lou. Okay. You go to the basement and I'll go outside. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. It's so all those kind of, just... all those word plays. That's what I always loved about Abbott Costello is there was the, 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 it wasn't straight up like slapstick, like, like three stooges. Cause that's what you watch it for. You watch it for like Wiley coyote style stuff. Yeah. The old physical, but the uh, Abbott and Costello had the slapstick stuff. They had the physical comedy, but they had the writing as well. I mean, the stuff yeah. that they wrote and the routines that they did were just, just, ab- I mean, no wonder they were the biggest selling act or the highest paid act during that era. Mm-hmm making four films in one year, three films in other years. I mean, talk about cranking out the material. They couldn't, you know, it got to a point of overexposure, unfortunately, which is what happens is you're making that many films and then you go on TV and it becomes a little bit too much. But Universal was kind of doing the same thing with the monsters too. It's just kind of cranking out House of Frankenstein, Ghost of Frankenstein, you know, the creature, creature walks among us, creature, you know, this, that, and the other thing was just kind of like, let's just keep feeding the machine because people are, uh, people are, want the want the material, which was great. The you know the the whole there was a whole mummies thing and, and Dracula's daughter. So there was all these <clears> movies <throat> that had sequels at a time when that really wasn't a thing. You know mm-hmm. when you think about it, there wasn't like this talk of like making a a follow up film at the time. I don't even think I don't even know if sequel was even a, a, a term back then for it. It was a draw. I mean, the people were, they kept coming back. I mean, and, 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 and in this, in this particular case, it was a, a, a very family friendly horror film. I don't yeah. know if, I don't know. I really don't know if any of these films were actually ever really that scary. Not to me. Uh, but, uh, but when, when you were I was little, younger, this was scary. Little, it was always the, the threat of Frankenstein was always, you know, it was, it, it wasn't like, iconic. Oh, it was just, to me, it was yeah. just cool. 
just because of the way they looked, you know? So, but it was like, but you know, the wolf man was like, he, he, he's still fully clothed, you know, the, the shirt oh, yeah. still in this movie, he's a little, <laughs> yeah, he's, up, his, you know? <laughs> he's got a shirt, he's got his dinner shirt, his dinner shirt on. <laughs> and, and Abbott just happens to be wearing the same, the same, exact, one, the same, same, the same like it looks like it's Navy blue. It, it's black and white, but it looks like it's like a Navy blue, yeah. like a, a Navy blue shirt. And he's wearing the same one and he's got the wolf mask. So they mistake him for biting. But, but with you know, like, McDougal. We, like we talked about in a pre in a previous episode, the, you can't get any more iconic than the Frankenstein image that that Karloff. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, that really carried it. The, the, the entire series, though, just wanting to see those monsters again. And you really didn't. I think at some point, if you're a kid, you don't really know actors. You don't you know, you, you're just kind of you just want to see. It didn't matter who was in the makeup, I guess. But as long as it had the same iconography right it's the same yeah. sort of like you know look you know even like the monsters like fred gwynn playing the it's still he's still absolutely like, Carl. As, as a matter of fact if you want to get creepy i mean he he makes those faces like when he's like, <laughs> like, like that. i mean he's got that f- long face like when he gets flustered big, and you know big mouth and he's like like i was he watching starts waving the, his arms he I starts like watching, waving his arms yeah i was watching the one today <laughs> with the with the dry bones where he was the tape recorder he's do 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 with you know with the uh, uh gary olsen you know the the dj at the time he was on yeah. laughing you yep. know uh, what was his name gary owens like, gary owens okay yeah and he played the DJ and he kept playing his song, like because he made it, the tape ended up in his hands and he and he's like playing it. And it was like the family's like, Oh, this this is terrible. And he's like, I happen to be the you know, oh, 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 you know, yeah. oh, was, or, or the one laughing. the was, one when when Herman when Herman turned normal, so he looked like Fred Gwynn and everyone thought he was ugly, like he was like in, you know, they had his hair like slicked back and he was like no makeup and so like some I forgot yeah. what happened, but he got turned into like a human and yeah. they couldn't deal with it, like he was so ugly to them right. and it was just like Fred Gwynn. It was just like you know, turning, turning those, take, and that taking that whole thing right because Grandpa was was the, was Dracula and Eddie was was like a baby wolf, wolf man. man. So yeah, all those, like you said, the icon of iconography, I- iconography, iconography. I can't say that word. <laughs> I, I can't old. say it. Grenography um, <laughs> is 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 something that persisted. We talked about it in our top three uh, with Andrew Kermeens that that it is one of those things and. When you're making that amount of films back then as well, you're almost cementing the legend too. So it wasn't like they just made Frankenstein in 1931 and then it just, they stopped. Mm -hmm. You know, they continued feeding that machine with more and more content. So yeah, people grew up with it. Like I said, we grew up with it because it was that was the kind of stuff you saw on TV. Um, We saw the Abbott and Costello stuff on TV as well. All this stuff is family friendly too, which is which is really what I liked about watching this film. Is like I, I was going to kind of sit down and enjoy it. Mm-hmm. You know, I knew I was, I was you know like I didn't have to worry about what I was going to see. You know, there's a, there's a place for that, but with this film, it's like this is one that you could put on for Halloween or put it on in the background and just have a and just enjoy it. Like you don't have to watch stuff. You're not going to miss many plot points. Let's put it that way. No, you know, it's... you're not watching it for that, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, you're, you're watching. Just... You can watch scene. You can pick up scenes, and 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 enjoy it and what's going on, and especially the whole end, mm-hmm. like the whole battle at the end when when everything finally comes to like a head. It's like okay, just, now it's you know just like every other monster movie, like we yeah. like we they've said, all been you know, dancing they, with each other throughout the whole film, and, and then they finally all end up killing each other, and it's the, the <laughs> you know yeah, it's the same kind of you know thing, once you know yeah once Frankenstein so. kind of gets revived, he's he's like. He's a maniac. terrorizing yeah. the place, and and there's that scene when they're when they're running away. Abin Costello, you know, basically the the Wolfman and Dracula are fighting, which means that the that Dracula is throwing vases and and pottery at the, at the Wolfman, trying to keep him at bay, like like it's just throwing stuff at him. But so then Frankenstein is chasing Abbott and Costello, and there's one part where they go into a room and they shut the door, and they put the bed in front of the door. Mm-hmm. But the door opens the other way. So Frankenstein just opens the door and kind of walks in start, and pushes the bed out of the, like starts pushing the bed. So it's like that kind of stuff. And, it, and, it, and it's, the, fun, it's funny, but then it, it's chilling because now Frankenstein is, is after them again. That's right. You know? The monster, the monster is very much in character. He's not, he's not playing a, you know, a comedic role there. It's yeah, just so it's just, it's just, it's, 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 you know, it's, it's all these mistakes. It's all this comedic, like sort of happenstances that just, just yeah, doesn't it's go like their the way. Costello way of getting out of those situations. comedy of errors kind yeah. of thing. And, it's, and it's, it's just, yeah. exactly. It's yeah. like, if it was a, if it was a different character, it, it, they might've found a different solution, but 
the you know they got out of it the Abbott and Costello way, right? You know, they and and they pushed the bet and Frankenstein fell on the bed and then and then Costello right. like put the covers on him and they ran out and uh, <laughs> and then there was one one scene in there also when Frankenstein's in that room and and Luke Costello takes the 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 tablecloth off the off the table he actually breaks the fourth wall he looks at the because he looks at the camera he's like oh pretty cool like that it actually worked you know yeah. when you pull yeah. when you pull That's something right. out and, n- and none of the glasses fall. Yeah. Uh, he, he looked right at the camera. He's like, Oh, what do you think about that? You know? So it's kind of a lot of stuff going on there. <laughs> and that's when he's like, you know, back, back. And it's just all, such great. Yeah. You know, how, how they brought all this stuff together. And, and like, you, like you said, like respect for both. And this would you be know? the last uh, time you see the monsters together. The, the original, the, the big three, as, as they call it, you know, Dracula, Frankenstein and the Wolfman. Yeah. This would be the last, I think, the last time they appeared on screen together. And yeah, because until... after that was Creature Creature from the Black Lagoon was, yeah. was really what kind of brought the Universal Monsters into the 50s. Because after in... that, pretty much all the franchises were done except for Creature kind of started. Not until years later when, you know, Universal was trying to reinvent <laughs> with The Mummy, with Brendan Fraser, with Stephen well, those Stock. Those were great. Stephen Summers came in and he really, you know, and then he, then he made the mistake of trying to do the whole monster mashup thing with Van Helsing. And yeah. uh, that was, that, that was a, a shit show. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, but I enjoy, I, I appreciated the, what he was going for there. It was like, it was, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely, I'm going for it. I am going to do pay homage to this stuff that we loved as kids is all seeing all the monsters together. Hugh Jackman. And then they, yeah. And then they Hugh tried it Jackman. again. Happy birthday. Uh, yeah. Uh, and him being sort of like more like a superhero kind of Van Helsing. Like he's young. He's, he's got the hat. He's like Indiana he's got Jones. These gadgets, he's got the gadgets. <laughs> the gadgets and, yeah. You know, it's like, okay. And, and then and that, Universal would try it again, right? With Tom Cruise. Oh my moment. God. Oh my God. You know, what, what, what they quote unquote called the dark, what was going to be the dark universe is, is that was going to kick off because it had Russell Crowe as Dr. Jekyll in there. Mm-hmm. So there, there was that attempt at kind of rebooting it again, but it just didn't. I don't know if it was because of Tom Cruise or, or what, but or people just weren't interested in it. And yeah, that was, was well into where the MCU. I mean, that was obviously was, them saying we're yeah, going to try and you know, establish some type of a a universe with these with these things. And it just didn't it just didn't but work. Why, but the thing is, why would you want to, though? You because you started it because there's right? money in them there, Hills. I, I, I know. <laughs> but still, I mean, the legacy <laughs> is there. I mean, you know, just leave it alone. Yeah. You know, that's the thing. You, yeah, you, but they figure people... if Marvel can do it, like Marvel set the blueprint for this kind of stuff in, in modern times, right? They yeah. showed that it can be done and it can be done not only successfully, but wildly successfully, right? Mm-hmm. So why not take a crack at it? You know, I think, I think in the 40s, I think it happened by accident. I don't think there was this you know, I, I think they were just making movies. It's like, yeah, let's make another horror film and let's put, you know, John Carradine as Dracula this time. And, and you know, this Bella Lugosi will be the monster, whoever's available. Like yeah. there was no thought of one one person portraying a character. Even Lon Chaney Jr. was in Son of Dracula as Dracula. So these guys yeah. were just like interchange. And you don't see that. You don't see like, like Robert Downey Jr. playing Thor in another film. Yeah, and then Paul Rudd playing Spider Man. It's like they, like they, that doesn't have these guys were just swapping roles, like whatever movie was being made, whoever was available. So I don't think it was a lot of forethought when it came to it, but when you look back on it, mm-hmm. it's like wow. When you if you if you kind of Google or go to Wikipedia and look up Universal Classic Monsters, you're going to see the yeah. filmography from 31 to like 50, 56 or something like that. It's like 25 years, literally worth of, right. of these films in one version or another. Again, some of them like the sequels, but then some of the stuff, like you said, like the black cat and some of those other ones that, that were a little bit lesser, like in mummy's tomb. And there was yeah, Phantom the of the of Opera the in there There's and multiple Invisible versions Mans. of that. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. a lot, a lot there. And then we forgot we, at the very end. Uh, yes. So they resolve. Yeah everything and it basically or you know I, I guess this would be true because this was the last one is all the monsters are are dead because lon cheney which was it was a great scene though because dracula's trying to get away and he's turned he turns into a bat mm-hmm. and just as he turns into a bat like the wolfman like dives out the window and catches the bat but they both fall like down into like the cliffs and like splash into the water. Yeah. So it was kind of a neat, like the way they tied him up. And then of course, Frankenstein gets burnt for like the thousandth time. Um, <laughs> although usually he's afraid of fire, but in this one, he walked right into the fire. Yeah. Yeah. Like he walked straight into it. So they, 
they kind of they're on a uh, Abbott and Costello are on a rowboat at the end because they were in the water trying to get away. I guess that might have been in I don't know the swamps of Florida somewhere with that yeah. being the Everglades. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> that's guess. where the castle was. So they're like, oh, no one, you know, the monster's gone and Dracula and you know these guys are no one will ever frighten us again. And then you hear you see like a cigarette lit. <laughs> and he goes, "Oh, what about me, the Invisible Man?" You know, yeah, and, it's, like, and it's and it's Vincent Price. Price, a nice little cameo. But, but at there. the time, if you look at the filmography, Vincent Price was not, has not done any horror films. He he did this voice, but he was not do, he didn't do any horror films till like 1953. Yeah, he so did he the, was not the horror icon. He was just still an actor, mainly a character actor. He was still very. I mean, when he did. Um, the, the return of the invisible man. Um, he was very, very young in that film because I, I, I just watched it and it's like, mm-hmm. wow, this could have been, this is probably one of his earliest roles. Yeah. But like you say, it, it wasn't until the fifties because I love the original with uh, Claude Rains. That was one of my favorites. Cause yeah. He's, and so, then, and then I think John you know, Carradine was in, yeah, he was, he invisible was one. man's revenge. <clears throat> yeah. Um, and then, but, but Vincent Price was, was not even close to becoming like the, it, it's funny. Cause we think of him as, as part of the horror kind of genre. Right. And he's one of the high, high watermark guys. Yeah. But when he cameoed as the invisible man, he wasn't even near that. He was still doing like regular feature films and, and right. character work and all that kind of stuff. So it was, it was very curious that all of a sudden he, he pops up and as, as the invisible man, as the voice of the invisible man, you should yeah, say. He, he would, um, come into that much later on in like the sixties with yeah all the, with the Corman with the, stuff and the Corman, the Arkoff, you know, kind of that, you know, the, the Edgar Allan Poe stuff that, you know, that you know, those all those adaptations that they they made with him as as the main lead. And, and then of course Dr. Fibes and, and yeah. the return of Doctor, which was creepy as hell. Like that that thing. Yeah, the abominable Dr. Fibes. Yeah, yeah. The that skeleton, was just, skull that was just, face. And it was and it was freaky and yeah. psychedelic and just weird you know just like wow this is and he was really into that that kind of lucid just sort of like lsd trip type stuff like he was he was yeah really, that was the style in, in the in like the yeah. mid the early to mid 60s <laughs> was like that weird just trippy yeah <clears throat> trippy stuff and and those that those films reflected that year it definitely yeah. reflected Most the definitely. era they were made yeah. when you watch those films like you know when <laughs> when they were when they were made <laughs> yeah. and oddly enough after after Evan Costello beat Frankenstein, they would actually team up with Boris Karloff. He was they would actually make two film two Evan Costello films with Boris Karloff. One would be called Meet the Killer, mm-hmm. Boris Karloff, and then Karloff would be Doctor. He would play Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde in Evan Costello meet Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde. So that was kind of interesting. And then in fifty one, Evan Costello would meet the Invisible Man, but it wasn't it wasn't Vincent Price. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was a box. It was a boxer who gets the invisible serum, and then Lou Costello gets to box, and the Invisible Man is is throwing the punches. So that's right. Yep. I think it was called like Louis the Looper or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah. he's like, like just like swinging, and 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 people getting like knocked out because the boxer was the Invisible Man, <laughs> and then they would meet. Uh, so uh, Doctor Jekyll, Mister Hyde, uh, and then meet the Mummy in 1955. So that really started really how well the Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein did just said, okay, we're just going to, we'll, we'll, we'll continue on this. Keep path. it going. So what, sure. Who else can we team them up with? And yeah, to, to varying degrees, the, the one with the mummy was good. Jo- Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I haven't seen those in ages, but I think that one was pretty good too. I think that's when, when Lou turns into a giant mouse, he takes <sighs> the, he takes the potion. I, I think at the end, every, like all these people took the drink, the thing. And, and there's like a whole bunch of Dr. Jekyll or Mr. Hyde's at, at the end. They're all like running around and I you can't tell right. who's who's who. I think you're I think right. He, yeah. I think he like dr- like drank something and turned into like a big mouth, like a big mouse yeah, head or I something. Do, it was really I do, trippy. I do remember that. Yes. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll have again, to. I'll, such such a long time since we've seen. Yeah. These, I have these I have the DVDs. Universal came yeah. out with three three separate packages of the Universal collection with Abbott Costello meet Frankenstein as a separate DVD. But all the mm-hmm. other ones, all the, that Universal stuff is on uh, this box set that I have. And I, you know, I've got it and I really should kind of just go and just start yeah, revisiting go for that it. stuff. Because I had, yeah, yeah I, it, it, you know, I forgot how much I missed it and, and how much of those old routines. You can watch them on YouTube, but when you watch it with a movie around it, uh, it, it it's a lot more fun because you get to spend a lot of time with with Abbott and Costello. And, and, and this it, was... Didn't they include the Meet Me Frankenstein? Isn't that included in the horror monsters box set? Didn't they? 
released. That's a good question. I don't think so. I, 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 I know when I, I mean, we're talking DVD. We're not even talking Blu-ray. That's how old yeah. it is. Okay. It, it's just, I have j- just like the separate Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein, like DVD release. Okay. And then there's like the Abbott and Costello universal collection for them, which is just their films. Now, I don't know. I, I do have a universal monsters DVD set from way back. Like when the mm. box sets were like that big. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. it's just, it's just the classic. It's just like the, the universal monsters, like the first like eight or something like that. Like right. the really, the, the, the originals. The, yeah. Yeah. The, the, the originals. Um, but this, this one fits in both. I mean, you can watch this if you're on an Abbott and Costello kick. And if you're on a universal monsters kick and you want to be it. completionist, sit down and watch this with your family. I mean, mm-hmm. it's a fun, it's a fun movie to put on maybe on Halloween night. You know, if you've got kids coming over trick or treating and you want something on in the background, this, this kind of stands like for me, kind of like where, where like a Christmas story or Charlie Brown Christmas. I mean, this is one of those films of like for families that you could, you could put on during that, during this holiday, you know, you don't need to go with the slasher and, and, like, like our like- friend Andrew was talking about, like the massive amounts of blood. You, you don't always need that. You know, no, you sometimes don't. you just want something that you could just kind of put on just and just mood. sit down and enjoy and that's kind right. of just have some good old fashioned scares. And, and yeah, that's Halloween that's is, is. Is, is, is not just it's fun. Right. It's, you know, and don't let your kids t- tell you that we don't want to watch it because it's black and white. You know, sit down with them, urge them to watch <laughs> it. It's, it's, they'll get some less. I know I, I, you know, my son, Jake, he, you know, he's took him a long time to get him into it's a black and white movie blah, 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 you know but yeah you, you get some chuckles you know you put some of this stuff on and he's actually you know he enjoys the 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 style he enjoys the the, the sort of he's not scared by him or anything like that it's just no, it's enjoyable it. to watch yeah it, exactly he enjoys the, the way that they're, they're they're invented the, you know the sort of the imagination behind it the, the way they look all that kind of stuff and, and again so I- iconic these these figures that even today, I mean, there's nobody who could dispute that. I think even yeah. the younger and, generation. And if, and if your son was afraid, you know, was was turning his nose up at black and white films, mm-hmm. I can imagine when you told him there were black and white TVs yeah. that only yeah. showed things in black and white. So that's even right. If it was color. You had no choice. That's right. And he and he's like, what? You know, like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's when the TVs were made for the format, right? They were with black. The broke, and the films were black and white, so make with, the TV and you black had to and use white. Okay, pli- uh, pliers to kind of change the channels because the, <laughs> the knob would fall off, and you're and you're and you're struggling, right? You're trying to get the it. antenna, you know, to fighting the with the rabbit ears, <laughs> the, the, the battle of the rabbit ears. So, yeah, yeah. This this is highly recommended. This is yeah. this is a great Halloween film. We we love it I, absolutely. Like I said, b- both of us, Eric and I, were both weaned comedically on on Abbott and Costello and like I said a, a lot of people in in the New York area were just because of this one station that just kind of you know you know what I I got a I just had like an epiphany I mean Channel 11 WPIX in New York actually was responsible for a lot of things sure because they used to show Star Trek every night at midnight Star Trek. for years they would show they would show the odd couple yeah, they would couple. show the Twilight Zone and they would show the honeymooners religiously this was before like endless news cycles mm-hmm. These th- you could you could turn on channel eleven at twelve thirty and you'd be in the middle of a Star Trek episode guaranteed, mm-hmm. no matter yep. what. And they would ju- that was their lineup. Like after the ten o'clock news or whatever or eleven o'clock news, they would do honeymooners and and then on Sundays you had and this yeah, yeah these were on the weeknights. But on yeah. Saturday nights you had um, right. I remember watching Saturday Night Live and but then I would go to channel eleven because they'd have Chiller. They would yeah. have like those anthology, those horror films of like 12 midnight and one o'clock in the morning. So you're kind of watching that kind of stuff too. So yeah, they, they had some really great broadcasting going on there. Yeah, I, I was kind of, I mean, you know, does it still exist? I mean, does the channel, is it still there? I, I believe it still does. I, I yeah. have sling, so I don't have like regular TV, but okay. it, I mean, it's not the same though. Of course, everything is just I'm sure. in, infomercials yeah. or reality shows, but back yeah. then, Pre, I mean, you know, you've got the segmenting of, of everything with Netflix and HBO and, and mm-hmm. Prime and everything. So you can pretty much, cho- you know, pick and choose what you want. But mm-hmm. um, it was nice back then just to have that stuff. And that was all that was available. So you kind of watched it and whether you wanted to or not. And it's like, oh, OK, this is actually pretty funny. And then you got you kind of got educated, got a comedy education from Evan Costello and Jackie Gleason. And yeah. And then, you know, you got watched, your sci-fi uh, and everything. Uh, an episode of King of Queens the other day is I, I I, I like him and, and yeah, he was funny on that show. And yeah. he, again, the Lou Costello, you know, the baby man aesthetic mm-hmm. thing going on. But there's an episode where he's, you know, supposed to be going to stop his friend from having an affair with another woman. 
and they, you know, they're, and before, and he doesn't want to get up to leave because he's watching Abbott and Costello be <laughs> Frankenstein. He's like, oh, look, he's like, look, he's so distracted by it. He's like, he's like, just like glued to the TV that he's, you know, it's like, look, he doesn't realize the mummy's behind. She's like, come on. Like, you know, like, you know, so, you know, it's that kind of thing. It was, it's funny. Yeah, but, it, yeah it's, it's, but that's the thing. It was like that New York thing. It's a, it's yeah. a, it's everybody knows it. If you grew up yeah, in New York, and, and you it's, know it. it's, co- it's comedy yeah. 101. I mean, yeah. you want to see the, the, the brilliance of, of writing back then when, yeah, you couldn't just curse or couldn't say, you know, I so, you know, we sound like old fuddy duddies of, oh, before you could curse. No, I, I, <laughs> I enjoy cursing as much as the next guy, believe me. Yeah. But to watch this, t- this type of humor and this type of comedy smartly written and smartly executed by a team like this, you, you're not, you're, you're going to win just with that. But then when they put the universal monsters in and, and keep them in their universe, as it were, like I said, they don't make them do slapsticky right stuff or tell jokes or anything and they're not really the butt of any of the jokes either they kind of know their own side of it they do exactly yeah, what they ju- they're just to in a story together yeah. it's a it's a horror story that happens that happens to happen to Evan costello or it's a comedy that happens to feature the universal monsters i'm not sure if it's a horror film that that features the, a comedy team or a comedy film that features horror elements. It's, 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 how you, it's how you look at it, right? It's just, I guess, yeah. 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 If you're coming from the, the classic Monsters fan, you'd be like, oh, this is you know Universal Monsters. If you're sure. coming from comedy, you're like, yeah, this is one of the best Abbott and Costello. So mm-hmm. yeah. Awesome. Well, that, that's going to do it for this episode. Highly I, recommend Abbott and Costello fun. meet Frankenstein. This one's, it, it, this is a Halloween gimme. This, this is a freebie for us. Just put this one on. Yeah. You can put it on by yourself and watch it. Put it on with family. Like I said, it's one of those ones you could throw on and not have to worry about anything or any, you know, anything kind of coming across the screen that people won't like. And and it's a classic for the ages. If you're if you're not laughing within the first five to ten minutes of this movie, then you can come make comments and and let us know. That, you know, because I mean, if we if we, you're if you're if you're not, we'll give you another Abbott and Costello film that you will. Then we sure. we 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 can certainly if if you, this one didn't do it for you, he's oh okay. Yeah, we'll we'll have some hit, hit us up. We can we can I can give we can give you Abbott and Costello titles forever that will that will keep you laughing. So that's that right. that's absolutely the truth, and and we should get, probably get to an Abbott and Costello film at some point. <laughs> um, although we've just did we just did one, so we actually we did, did get to one. So. Or did we do a Universal Monsters? Hmm, that's it. let us know in the let us know in the comments. Was this yes. a Universal Monsters film that we talked about, or was this an Abbott and Costello film? Yeah. You can do that on Facebook and Instagram at thirty three twenty four podcast. If you want to do it on Twitter and send a tweet our way, we're at thirty three twenty four p. New episodes every Thursday. So thanks for checking out this episode with us. We've got quick hits every Monday, which are shorter form uh, videos, little nuggets for you to check out, keep you tied over. Uh, we do live shows every other Wednesday on Facebook and YouTube. So definitely check us out there. Um, and for that, that's going to be it for this Spooktober episode of Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein. Thank you for joining us. For Eric, this has been Dean. We will ask you to please be kind and rewind. You've been listening to the 3324 Podcast with Dean Legiro and Eric Cooper. You can find us on your favorite podcast provider. So please like, subscribe, and rate to become a part of the 3324 family. Your feedback is important, so make sure to follow us on Instagram and Facebook at 3324podcast and on Twitter at 3324p to join the conversation. <laughs>